Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark TV. You guys know who I am. I'm Dr. Angela Butchester, and you know what I like to do on my show. I want to enlighten you. I want to inspire you. I want to empower you to become your best self. Now, scripture reminds us that the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And today, we want you fired up about my guest. Her name is Angela Fortnum, and we're talking about her book, Pages and Leaflets of North Oxfordshire. So go on, get comfy, get cozy, get your coffee or get your tea, because we are about to get started. Hello, Angela. Thank you so much for joining me here on Daily Spark TV. Hello, Angela. Thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. And kudos to your parents for giving you such an amazing name of Angela. There are not too many of us in the world, but when I meet a fellow Angela, I'm always happy to do so. Now, speaking of names and a little bit about ourselves, we like to give our guests an opportunity to introduce themselves on the show. So with that being said, um, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? What makes you you for perhaps those people who are unfamiliar with you or your work? Well, I'll start with where, when I was born, not going to tell the year, um, um, where, where I went to school and where I started work. Okay, I was born in Banbury, North Oxfordshire in England in the late 1940s, that's as far as I'm going. Went to three schools in the town, infant, primary and grammar school and having left school at the age of just over 16 I went and got myself a job in a local bank. I stayed there for mm, 16 years, transferred to Birmingham in England uh, to the mortgage department where I stayed until I took early retirement. Following early retirement I didn't do much for the first year or two. I was so mentally and physically exhausted from work that um, I needed to take a rest. Then I took in, up interest in doing a course in health and social care, something completely different for the Open University. Um, and then I decided to um, take up Ancestry, which is the root of my book. Now, speaking of the book, being an author, is that something that you have always wanted to do? Or did you find that through discovery and the opportunity in life, you said, yes, I need to share this information? That's quite correct. When I found all the information, being an only child, I didn't want to waste it. So I put it down on paper and published it. And by doing this, I actually found some cousins. Absolutely. How exciting is that? And, you know, I have to agree with you that it is a wonderful thing to know um, who makes up your family and have these, these new discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, I participated in one of those the DNA um, uh, platforms there, and it has been absolutely wonderful to find uh, my family from all over the place. We knew about the, the English family, but did not know about the family in Norway and Sweden. So you're right to make the discoveries. It's always a beautiful thing. So kudos to you for, for doing that. I love it. I love it. Now, the title of your book, was that inspired by uh, your, your research? How did you come about your title? Well, the family name that I was looking at was Paige hence pages, um, the smaller members of the family would be a small sheet of paper, leaflets. The family came from North Oxfordshire, and so my sense of humour put it all together, and it's pages and leaflets of North Oxfordshire. I see. I, I love it. And I, I like asking that question because there's usually a story behind mm -hmm. the title of every book that, that we discover. So I love it. I love it. Now, when you were in the writing process, how did you take what is perhaps research 
and turn it more so into a book in a format in which someone would want to read along? Well, that was difficult. I've never written a book before. Um, and I hadn't really read any books on this genre. So I put pen to paper, um, virtually took it from the um, plans that I'd got of the family um, and wrote the book, tidied it up and sent it off to a publisher. And hey ho, I printed it. Now, thank you for, for mentioning that, because that's a question that I like to ask as well about the process of determining which way you would actually present your book. Many authors uh, want to self-publish just because they want, you know, full control over all aspects. Mm -hmm. Others make the decision perhaps to use a publishing house and leave it to the professionals. Just do the prompts that they give you and you know that it's going to be correct. How did you come to the determination of using a publishing house as opposed to self-publishing? Well, I've written the book hadn't got a clue where to go next. And to be honest, I went on to Google. Found a publishing house and struck gold first time. I love it. I love it. You know, it is such an inspiration for the stories because I know that many of the people who listen um, or watch the program, they're aspiring authors as well. And they want to know, what did you do? You're successful, what did you do? Let me do the same thing, um, you know, for them, of course, but let me do the same thing because it seems like the process worked out and it sounds like it did for you as well. Mm -hmm. Now, when you determined that you were ready to present it to the world, now, the pandemic was not a factor in many of our lives, you know, just a few months ago, but things have, have changed. We thought we were coming out. It looks like we're going back in for many countries uh, dealing with a different variant. With that being said, how has uh, dealing with COVID affected how you've been able to get out there and really present your book? Has it dampened some of your efforts, unfortunately? Yes, some of the book fairs haven't um, happened, although I hope they will happen in the coming 12 months. Um, due to physical difficulties, I can't get out to bookstores to sign books. So I've had to sort of mix and match some of the uh, sales things. And regrettably, um, earlier this year, I was diagnosed with the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, so I've been having chemotherapy. Fortunately, everything's fine now, so that worry has been put to one side. Oh, I definitely know about that battle. I am a breast cancer survivor. So uh, from, from one survivor to a future survivor, I am definitely going to keep you in my prayers and, and continue to tell you to march on. It will be okay. That can be a very trying time in our lives, but we do know that we have an amazing God. So all things are possible. So continue prayers for you with that. And you made a really great point. A lot of people are dealing with illness also during this time, and it has really shifted how we're able to operate and, and move during this time. Now, speaking of um, making sure that people understand how to utilize your book, you have not necessarily written uh, a fictional novel of created characters and, and all of that. So how is the, what is the best way for someone to read the book? Would it still be from cover to cover like you would any other novel? Did you put it in chapters or sections? What's the best way for us to read it? Well, you could read it as a, a quick read from cover to cover, and then it may inspire you to actually research your own family history, your own ancestry, in which case it gives pointers as to what sort of documentation you might be able to find. And because I incorporated the religious beliefs of the family members, I also looked at the churches and chapels that they were connected with, and that also added to the family story. 
You know, I could not agree with you more. Uh, being here in the States, uh, when it came to my family that's in other countries, a lot of that documentation was of church record of baptisms that had gone on. And so you are so right, the marriage licenses and, and things like that. So it really is important to take that all in. Don't take that for granted, but instead to take that all in and see the, the evolution of, of your family from a spiritual perspective as well. Many times you can see a denominational change uh, from one particular church to another church, or you may even see an increase in participation. So I definitely have to agree with you with you there. Now, when it comes to uh, the amount of research, that is required. I know that since uh, some of the elder members of my family have passed away, uh, I have taken on the role of, of the family historian, hence taking the DNA test to see how many more branches do we have. Mm -hmm. When it comes to that type of research, um, is this for the lighthearted? Do you have to be committed to going through the paperwork, to being on your computer and finding those breadcrumbs? If you're really serious, yes, you do. If it's just um, uh, one off hobby that you might or might not finish, then, then that's up to you. But once you get started, you get hooked. I could not agree with you more. Oh my goodness. The number of nights that I was up to 2 or 3 a.m. because I found a discovery and mm. wanting to share that with everyone else that I knew might be awake at the same time and saying, check out your email. I have found a picture. And oh, what a discovery when you're able to find a picture of someone. So absolutely, I, I agree with you. I agree with you there. Well, Angela, it is time for us to take a very quick break. But before we do, can you remind everyone, please, what is the title of your book? Where can we get a copy? And how do we stay in contact with you? Yes, it's called Pages and Leaflets of North Oxfordshire. Please excuse my different pronunciation from yours. It's a different continent. Um, it can be from Amazon, or you can have a signed copy via my website, which is angelafortnum.com. They're also available um, from Barnes & Noble, as well as Amazon and Gardeners. Um, you can also find me on Facebook under Angela Fortnum. Alrighty, everyone. Now you know where you can get a copy of the book. We'll be back right after this. And we are back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark TV. You guys know who I am. I'm Dr. Angela Chester. My guest today is Angela Fortnum, and I can't wait to continue this conversation about her book. My next question for you is about the discoveries that you made. Were there any discoveries that were confirmation from perhaps stories that you had heard over the many years? Or were there any discoveries that were truly discoveries and kind of surprised you? I hadn't heard many stories about the history of the family, so they were all a surprise. The first one was the eldest son of my seven times great grandfather, James, which is as far back as I go, was buried in the old meeting yard, which is Quaker. So that's where the family's history started. But through the years, they became Church of England, my five times great grandfather, let me just check. Yes, <laughs> was a parish clerk. Um, for a number of years. Um, so just digressing slightly, um, that meant he could read and write after a fashion. He perhaps couldn't, he couldn't spell names properly because the people he was marrying, he was um, witness to the wedding, they couldn't spell their names. So they said it, and you must bear in mind like there is in America, they're different dialects. So he did the best he could so that does make things difficult when you're trying to find things. I'll just add that in. <laughs> um, my 
he was Church of England. His father, his son Joseph, his great grand, no, sorry, his grandson Joseph um, was a Methodist. And then his son was Church of England. So we, we've been through the, all the denominations and the family is now Church of England. You know, you are you are so right there. When we look at our our history, and especially here in the in the states, when when we look at the the various names of the various peoples that were here, especially when um, when America was was still such a a, a baby country, if you will. Um, people could not uh, read and write many of them. Um, and you're right. So when census was taken, uh, many times people would say their names and they themselves did not know how to spell their name. And the census worker would write what they believed was was correct and and true you you are so right um i remember doing an interview and talking about my uh 13th great grandfather um uh, lord william cecil and making sure that i said cecil and not cecil how we would say it here uh in the states and, and just making that distinction and understanding how important it is to, to try to honor, especially our friends and family that may be from another country. And there is a different pronunciation because that pronunciation has a meaning behind it. So we do need to um, try to do something that brings us together instead of, instead of pulling us apart. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So I'm so glad that he was able to do that. That is awesome. I love that discovery. Now, were there any discoveries that um, you decided to keep personal? Not that the, the incident was something not worthy of sharing, but just you may not have shared everything. How much of the information you gathered did you share? Most of it, I would say 98%. This, this is to help people who want to do their own ancestry, their own lineage, to say, well, look, come on, you can find this, you can find that. Just look here or there, maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. I know that here in the States, um, a lot of church records, and I believe you said that as well, um, a lot of church records can be found uh, here in the state of Utah. Um, if you're if you're the type of person who would like to travel, meaning that it's a great place to go. I know that that's the way that my dad did it, a very old school way, but very proficient of traveling and following the paperwork. Nothing mm -hmm. like a great road trip. Um, I'm able to do it a little bit differently and do the digital version because I have access to all of the records thanks to this particular platform. Now, when you were doing your research, were you, um, you know, team road trip? Were you able to travel and find the paperwork or was it more so done on the computer? I was more mobile in those days. Um, no, I hadn't got a computer when I started. It was flip chart paper and a pencil and a rubber. Went to the, uh, went to the library and started with the facts I knew, which was my mother, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, and worked through the years from there. Started with the baptism records, then the marriage records, or if there wasn't a marriage record, I would look at the bands, which are read out for three consecutive weeks before a wedding to see if anybody has an objection. Don't know whether you do that in the States, I must admit. And then, of course, the death, the burial records. Because I was following the mail line, then they weren't going to move. They were going to stay put. So it was a good chance that their burial would be in the same village or, a, or an adjacent village. Oh, wow. What a really great point to make there um, with determining which which line you are, you're able to to follow through on for someone that's that's true um, women do have a tendency to marry and then move 
to the the state of of her husband's birth or um if he should get a job many times we move uh to keep the family together so so you are right where men may have a tendency to stay a little closer a little closer to home what a great uh, aha moment that you just gave someone to to really think about how they're they're processing uh, it all. I love it. I love it. Now speaking of this walk that we that we have, um, I know that for many people, uh, finding out about their family not only gives them a physical connection in that they're able to see a picture or they're able to read a name of a newly discovered grandparent or aunt or uncle, but sometimes it has that spiritual connection as well. Did you find that in any way your faith was increased or did it expand in any way with the new discoveries that you found? Well, not the new discoveries because it was a bit piecemeal as I found things, and then I had to, like a jigsaw, put them together. But when I got the information to write the book, then that became more real. Ah, I see what you're saying. When you're in the process of actually putting it all together and presenting it as the book, that's when it comes to life for you. And, you know, yeah. I can understand, I can understand that because now it's a collective work as opposed to just various, various papers, if you will. I can, I can definitely, definitely understand that. Now, I want to ask you some questions, kind of shifting gears just a little for our aspiring authors out there. I know that for many of them, they wish that someone had told them to do this instead of that when they were putting their book together. Or perhaps you may have even wished that you had known a little bit of a, a, a trick or a tip, not a trick, but a tip more so to make the process easier. Is there any information that you can share to that aspiring author out there to make it easier with getting um, from start to finish with the process of writing? I found that it's a good process if you actually give the paper work to somebody else to read that doesn't know you. They treat them as if they are somebody that's bought the book and let them criticize it, accept the criticism because it's going to help. You know, that is such good advice. I, I like that um, because it isn't someone who's going to necessarily give you the nice version of what you want to hear, but they're also not going to, they're not going to be mean or malicious with it, but it's going to be that constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. I love that idea. I, I really do. Oh, that, that was, that was really good. Now about the cover of the book. I know that for many people, they're not worried about the words. They'll say, oh, Dr. Angela, I have the words down. I love writing. My problem is deciding upon um, how to convey my message in the cover. How were you able to, to decide what your cover would look like? Well, I wanted a rural setting, old fashioned looking houses, no telegraph poles, no cars, no people in fact, because the picture might represent the wrong era and very much greenery because again it's rural absolutely and you know another another nugget there don't choose a picture if you're not sure of the era. You are mm. so right. I know that for many people here, um, speaking of getting things a little bit wrong, um, folks, I think, confuse the 20s, the 30s, and the 40s here, mm. <laughs> here in this country um, just because it, it looks all the same to a very naive eye. But for someone who perhaps lived uh, during that time period, I know that my father was born uh, in the in the 30s. Um, they would be able to to pick out and say, "Oh no, that wasn't 39 mm -hmm. at all." So you're right. We do need to be very mindful and respectful of, of the things that that we present. Now, last little little bit here on on presenting as far as your book is concerned. Now, 
I know that many authors aspire to write other works. Um, you did something that was about your family and, and that may be the only book that you write about your family. So I don't want to assume that you're done. So I do want to ask, are there more books uh, in the works for you? Do you plan on expounding either on what you've discovered about your family or perhaps another genre? No, I should stay with genealogy, I think, for a moment. My next book, which I've started, is about William Page, which is, goes down another line of the family, and he and his family emigrated to Canada, which will make research a little bit more difficult. I love it. I love it. It is always exciting to see our family come and go across the pond over the years. So that is that is awesome. Well, before I let you go, Angela, I would love to give you one last opportunity to please share with us the title of your book. Where can we get a copy? And how do we stay in contact with you? Right, it's called, thank you. It's called Pages and Leaflets of North Oxfordshire. It's available on, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and on my website, if you buy one on my website, you'll get a personally dedicated signed copy. Um, my website is Angela Fortnum. Uh, um, sorry, AngelaFortnum.com. And I've also got a Facebook page, Angela Fortnum. I love it. Thank you again, Angela, for coming on and sharing your story with us today. Thank you for having me. I'll say that again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And viewers, thank you for spending some time with us here as well. You could have been anywhere, but you chose to spend a part of your day with us. And I appreciate that. I hope that we have enlightened, inspired, and empowered you again today. As always, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all that you do. Until next time, everyone, remember that you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Welcome to Daily Spark TV. Are you an author with a faith-based book? Be a guest. Serious about your product or service and want to try something new? Sponsor an episode. I see you're ready to get started. So visit drangelachester.com. Thanks again for watching Daily Spark TV. Hi everyone, Dr. Angela here. Just wanted to take a few moments to wish you and your family an amazing autumn. It is during this time of the year that we start to take in the harvest. Well, Deuteronomy 11:14 reminds us that not only will God provide the rain, but he will provide the grain, the new wine and the oil that we need in order to be sustained. So as we start to gather with friends and family during this season, may you be reminded of all that God has done, is doing, and will continue to do in your life. So from all of us here at Daily Spark TV, may you have an amazing harvest. And remember that you, you are blessed in the Lord. Have a great day, everyone.